go to the last, <coughs> let's go to the last page. Welcome, this is Senior English B, and we are working now with Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. Let's go to the last uh, of, the, of the text, page 818. That's where you should be in your hymnals, 818. We are now going to make some, some summative observations and comments about Coleridge's Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner as we are preparing for the examination coming next week. You are taking in class notes as we work. Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner is a narrative poem, that is to say it tells a story. Coleridge is telling a story through the story of the old man who will say, I was alone on a wide, wide sea, uh, where he says, I committed a terrible act. What was the terrible act that he committed? He killed an innocent creature, a bird, an albatross. Uh, it's not so much that he killed the albatross that gets him in trouble. What gets him in trouble? Because all he, all he does is kill a bird. It's like no big deal. What is it that really gets him in trouble? Immediately after killing the bird, what happens? They hit what we call the doldrums. There's no wind. There's only sun. And all of those men do what? They slowly die. He is cursed with living, not dying. They curse him by doing what? Putting the albatross around his neck. Right? Through a strange series of events, he looks up and thinks that in fact some ship is coming to his rescue, but no. What is this ship? The ship of death that will in fact wager as to whether he himself will die. He is not allowed to die. Notice how we have to say it that way. At this point, you want to die, right? Because you're dying, starving, and, and uh, of thirst. Uh, and then the ship becomes animated. That is to say, the dead men on the deck of the ship all rise and begin to do their work. For those of you who are Pirates of the Caribbean fans, you kind of go, oh, now I understand the origin of this storyline. Right, that's right. And so you have these kinds of corpses that reanimate to help sail the ship. We have a pivotal moment, though, in the, in the middle part of the poem where we're told that he will begin to look into the uh, ocean and he will see something um, that, that, that becomes very important for him. What, what, what are we talking about? Does anyone know what we're talking about? What's going on? There's a pivotal moment. <coughs> I'm, on, I'm with you on page 807. Why doesn't he just shoot himself? It's a good question. Like if he's it will there. become a question often of those involved in survival mode. Why not suicide? This will become, of course, one of the penultimate questions that Victor Hugo will ask, I'm sorry, uh, Victor Frankl will ask in his classic text, Man's Search for Meaning. I often will pass titles on to you, none more compelling than this one. Are you ready for this? Frankl, Victor Frankl, is a practicing psychiatrist when the Nazis invade. He ends up in Auschwitz. He is a PhD psychologist, psychiatrist, and he ends up in Auschwitz, the worst of the concentration camps, where, as a psychiatrist, he's <coughs> intrigued by the whole experience of, for example, the Nazis walking into the barracks every evening and handing out ropes and belts demonstrating that there are, in fact, rafters in the top and making sure they all understand how to hang themselves. Every evening they would do this, these Nazi guards. In the morning, Frankel will report some men had hung themselves while other men had not. And it, and it was exactly the very question that Mr. Lang is positing. Why is it that some, this is Victor Frankel's question, he ends up writing Man's Search for Meaning because he lives through the emancipation of Auschwitz and then goes back to practicing psychiatry again. What kind of a mind screw would that be? After having gone through the experience of the Holocaust and the death camps, 
He was always interested in this question, though. Why is it some men quit and other men just refuse to quit? What is that about? Why is it that our, mar that our mariner... Well, we may have an insight here on page 807. Notice that he is looking at the beautiful, beautiful creatures of the sea. I'm with you at the bottom of 807. Beyond the shadow of the ship, I watched the water snakes. They moved in tracks of shining white, and when they reared, the elfish light fell off in hoary flakes. I'm at the top of 808. Within the shadow of the ship, I watched their rich attire, blue, glossy green, and velvet black. They coiled and swam, and every track was a flash of golden fire. Oh, happy living things. Notice the exclamation mark. No tongue their beauty might declare. A spring of love gushed from my heart. Line 285. It's a crucial line. And I blessed them unaware. What does that mean, bless them? I blessed the creatures of the deep. Do you have any sense of what it means? I bless them unaware. Appreciate. That is the word. Let's write it down. It's so important to understanding this poem. Outstanding. Harder has decided to hit it out of the park this morning. Lang wants to know how he pulled that out of. <laughs> I bless them unaware means I, I prayed a special prayer of appreciation, respect. How is this different from an earlier attitude that he had towards nature? <laughs> Yeah, he shot the bird earlier, right? <laughs> now, instead of shooting God's creatures, as we'll hear the mariner talk about at the end of the poem, now, notice, blessed unaware. Keep reading. Sure, my kind saint took pity on me, and I blessed them unaware. The self-same moment. This may be our answer, Mr. Lang, to the question, why doesn't he just blow himself away? The self-same moment I could pray. And from my neck... So free, the albatross fell off and sank like lead into the sea. A pivotal moment. What happens? Mr. Ramos, what happens? At the moment that he can appreciate the beautiful things of nature, what happens to this bird that they've got strung around his neck that's decomposing, obviously stinking? Falls. What happens to the albatross? It does what? Falls it falls off. He kind of like learned his lesson. Ah, now let's move. Mr. Lang's taking us there. Now let's move to the reading of this poem as metaphor. Miss Keller, this poem becomes very famous after it's published as a work of symbolism or metaphor. What does that mean? Metaphor. Do you have any idea what that means? Something that represents something else. In other words, let's say it this way, Mr. Frederick. This poem is, yes, no doubt, a poem about a guy who ends up on the ocean and he hits the doldrums and everybody dies but him and somehow miraculously he makes it home. Yes, that's true. But it also is a poem which represents some things. For example, the human existence can be understood as a journey on a wide, wide sea where all alone one must be, all of that kind of thing. Let's take a look now at the end of the poem. What is it that the mariner, and now I'm coming back to our questions of yesterday, what is it that the mariner wants us to understand? I'm with you on page 818. Oh, wedding guest, lot top of page 818. Oh, wedding guest, this soul hath been alone on a wide, wide sea. So lonely twas that God himself scarce seemed there to be. Now, I asked you yesterday about references to Tintern Abbey. You will maybe recall, there's several, you will maybe recall that at the end of Tintern Abbey, he predicts, Wordsworth, to his, do, to his sister, Dorothy, <coughs> you're going to have times coming forward in your life when you're going to feel totally <coughs> alone. And it's at that moment, he says, I hope that you recollect this moment when we're sitting next to the beautiful river and we're having this time in nature together so that you can get through that. Remember, he says, then there, so therefore I dare to hope, right? Because he says, I have food enough for future years. That is to say, I have ways to kind of get through the bad stuff of life. This is a fundamental romantic idea that the human existence is often very solitary, very alone. That is to say, as one senior once put it, I sometimes know what it means to be completely alone in a room of a bunch of people. Wait a minute, if you're in a room with a bunch of people, how can you be alone? You're not alone, you've got people all around you. That's the distinction between being alone and being lonely, right? 
The notion that one is completely isolated so that one has nothing else to rely upon. He says, I've been there, I've done that. Now, literally, as Ms. we were talking to Ms. Keller and Ms. Cruz Nicholas, yes, that can be literal, but it can also be kind of uh, symbolic, right? Life, the human existence can kind of be this way. At 3A, Joseph Conrad, in his famous text, Heart of Darkness, will say it this way. We live as we dream, alone. We live as we dream alone. Now, that's one view of this notion. Notice, keep reading. Oh, sweeter than the marriage feast, which is where in regards to the young kid? It's right behind him, right? The, the work tour is right behind him. The party, the yay, everything is great, right behind him. Oh, sweeter than the marriage feast, tis sweeter far to me to walk together to the kirk with goodly company. What is a kirk? When do we know this word? It is a church, yes. And now the poem is going to give it the poem is going to get religious, for, for lack of a better word. Go ahead. To walk together to the kirk and all together pray, while each to his great father bends, old men and babes and loving friends and youths and maidens gay. Farewell, farewell. Coleridge is going to bring this thing to an end finally. It's been a long poem, right? Some 37 minutes that I have read aloud for us. Farewell, farewell, but this I tell to thee, thou wedding guest. Now here's the moral to the story. He prayeth well, who loveth well, both man and bird and beast. He prayeth best, who loveth best, all things both great and small. For the dear God who loveth us, he made and loveth all. Wait a minute, what is it that's the point of this story? Can you put it in your own words now on the notes in front of you? What is the point of what it is that this story has been telling? Now, let's get it clear. The old man's got to tell the story for penance sake. What does that mean? Right, I did something really terrible, and so now to pay for my sins, I've got to tell this story over and over again. Not just anybody. I tell it to the people who I think are worthy of hearing it. For example, in my work true example, that would be you on the streets of Denver. And you go, oh, this guy thought I was worth this story. But what's the point of this story? He just said these lines, but how are you going to put these lines in your own words? Mr. Rothlinger, you're going to reduce these lines first to a single line? What's his point? Like we all come from the same place, so maybe we're all created equal. Right, right. This is a very egalitarian message, isn't it? Tim, Tom Jefferson, notice I said 1800. Jefferson will write the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident. All men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights that among these life, liberty, and happiness. In what year? 1776. 24 years before this poem. So you can kind of see that the notion of egalitarianism Democracy is in the air, both in the American colonies as well as, of course, in England. Notice here, all creatures, both great and what? Small. Small. That is to say, even an albatross is of importance in the larger picture. Don't screw around with nature without thinking about it. Now, there have been readers of this poem who have, of course, argued this poem is saying don't go out you know, and blow away elk and go hunting and that kind of thing. And certainly you could make that argument from this poem. But it seems to me Coldridge is making a larger philosophic argument about, for example, Warland High School. That in the end, whether you're a freshman or a senior, what are we going to say? We're all equal. In what regards are we equal? Because clearly freshmen and senior are not equal in regards to classification. In what ways are freshmen and seniors equal? How are they equal? What makes them equal and therefore worthy of respect? What does make them equal? I guess we'd better ask that to seniors before the claimed spirit week. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> we'll save for after. After? Don't start preaching until after when we jack those poor lowly little guys and then we can feel bad about it later. Yeah. It's obviously, it's obviously this notion, let's write it in our notes, the notion of the contiguity of all humanity. That is to say, there is, no, there is no part of nature that somehow gets to be considered lesser than. Somehow we're all interconnected. And this notion of being interconnected is, again, a very romantic idea. Extremely romantic idea, right? We are coming to an idea in the Enlightenment and the Romantic period that posits all of us somehow have value and meaning. Therefore, equal rights. We hold these truths to be self-evident. All men are created equal. 
Of course, he says men. Later, we'll understand that to mean all humans. And even later into the 21st century, the debate becomes all species. If you can't argue all species, the question is obviously, why not? Why aren't all species of equal value? That is to say, under the law, right? Which would be the Jeffersonian notion of democracy, as we spoke of it last year. Now to finish. The mariner whose eye, I'm, I'm finishing on page 80 The mariner <coughs> whose eye is bright, whose beard with age is hoar, is gone. And now the wedding guests turn from the bridegroom's door. Again, as we said yesterday, he hears the story. He's so excited to go into warp tour. The story is told to him. But now when he can go into the party, now that he can go to the concert, he turns around and he walks away. And now to the final stanza. He went like one that hath been stunned and is of sense forlorn, a sadder and a wiser man. He rose the morrow more. What? He gets a story, a whacked out story about some old fart that ends up in a boat, kills a bird, ends up in the doldrums. Everybody dies except for him. Somehow miraculously he makes it home. And that story, A, makes this kid not go into the party, and B, makes him wake up the next day sadder but wiser. I need help understanding. This makes no sense to me. Can Wordsworth 10 Turn Abbey give me any help here? Let's go to 10 Turn Abbey real quickly. Some of you maybe gave some thought to my question of yesterday. And I'm on page 789. I'm sorry, uh, back, back even further up, page uh, 787. Wordsworth is talking in the, in the middle of Tintern Abbey about what it was like when he was young and he came to the mountains. He says, when like a row, I bounded o'er the meadows and the streams. You know, in other words, I was like a young kid. I never had to think about being in the mountains as being something sacred or holy. It was like the thing I got to do and have good fun at. But he said, I'm, t I'm different. He says, that time has passed and all his aching joys are now no more and all its dizzy raptures and all that kind of stuff. And then he starts talking more seriously. Look what he says at line 88 or so. For I have learned. See this? Well, this is going to sound very much like our young man who was told by the old man at the end of Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. We're told that he, that he walked away. He was sadder and he was wiser in the morning. For I have learned, look what he says, uh, roughly line 88. For I have learned that <clears throat> to look on nature, not as in the hour of thoughtless youth. Uh-oh, there's our young kid. That's you outside of the uh, outside of work tour. Thoughtless youth, right? Dude, I got to get to... To the concert. I got to go to the concert. I got to go to the concert. Really? Why? Because that's what I'm supposed to do. But what if I were to tell you that right after the concert, you'll get rear-ended and you're dead? You still want to go to this concert or are you going to do something else with your last three hours of your life? Some of us would say, yeah, I'm going to the concert. Others of us would say, woo, if I only got three, years or three hours left of my life, I'm probably not going to do that. If I really know I'm going to be dead, I'm probably not going to do that. There's three or four people. I better take care of business <laughs> because before I say goodbye... For reals, I probably need to say goodbye. Uh, you know what I'm saying, right? Notice he says, uh, I've learned to look on nature not as thoughtless youth, but hearing, oh, look what he says at line 90. Hearing oftentimes the still sad music of humanity, nor harsh nor grating, though of ample power to chasten and subdue. He says, when I think about the world, he says, I can get kind of sad and sober. I think differently. Question, why does this kid wake up the next morning a wiser and sadder? Maybe sadder because like he realized like what he was doing to nature. And maybe like wiser because like he feels like he needs to be more respectful. A brilliant observation, Mr. Judy said. I'm gonna I'm gonna kinda reframe what he said. What if the young man realizes he's killed his albatrosses? Now we're not speaking literally, are we? We're not talking about the young kid going out with a crossbow and blowing away birds. What are we talking about? He's killed his albatrosses. What does that even mean? He's done some bad stuff. In, in what regards bad? Because quite frankly, killing an albatross is not that necessarily quote unquote bad. What was the word that just got used in Ten Turn Abbey? He calls it what kind of youth? Thoughtless. He took it for granted. There you go. The notion that the actions of our life are oftentimes thoughtless. He's smarter, wiser, he understands something, but he also is a little bit sadder. It's like seniors often will report right about this time in the fall. You know, I think I could probably go back if I had to 
And if I had to do the three years of high school all over again, I think I'd do it a little differently. Just a bit. One or two choices I made might make differently. Now, no, of course, the reality of the human condition is you can't go back, right? You can't go back. All you can do is live with the reality that you have right now. And you kind of are aware of the fact that as things happened in your life, some of them were good, some of them were not so good. Your response was... But some seniors will report, my three years have spent to some degree a little more thoughtless than my senior year is becoming for me. Which is interesting because that was happening to your pals last year as seniors when you were a junior. But for many of them, you didn't understand it. And maybe you identified, they started to get a little bit more sober. They started to get a little bit more like, in, you know, reflective, in, internally reflective. And you would often maybe even ask them, what is wrong with you? Dude, you don't seem to want to have the kind of fun. Well, it's different. I'm kind of coming to the end of this thing. And now I got to like start thinking about what's going to happen next. And I'm not altogether excited about the fact that I got to kind of go on. Uh, but in other ways, I'm really excited. But I'm uncertain. I don't know what's coming forward a sadder and wiser. That is to say, are you ready for this? If you read this poem well, you become the young kid in the poem. And in the process of reading the poem, you internalize the message to the degree that the next morning you wake up a little bit wiser, but maybe also a little bit sadder as you go forward. Of course, if you live long enough, you become the old man who tells the story. For those of us who coach with little kids or we work with younger people, we're aware that already those kinds of things, if you have younger brothers or sisters or whatever, you're aware that already that kind of thing kind of starts to happen where you become kind of the adult and somebody else becomes the kid and the roles reverse. And now all of a sudden you get to start kind of giving advice. Of course, the advice the old man gives is at the back end of a story where he has to admit, I totally screwed it up. I totally screwed it up. I've had seniors who say, I respect most the adults in my life who begin by saying, I'm going to tell you how I screwed up, and then I'm going to suggest you try not to do that. As opposed to the ones who say, don't do this, and when you say, why, didn't you do it? And they will say, we're not having this conversation. And you see a certain kind of hypocrisy or duplicity there, right? Do you tell... Do you tell the, the, the advice without admitting that you yourself came to this advice through shooting an albatross? Don't shoot albatrosses. Really? Why not? Because it's bad. Why? You never shot an albatross? Not having that conversation. Don't shoot albatrosses. Some kids will respond by saying, dude, if, if, you know, if you're not going to be honest with me, I don't need to take your advice. Notice the old man here. He'll tell the story. It pains him to tell the story. But he has to tell the story before he can finally get to the advice that he's going to give. All right, there you go. The end now of uh, Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. I want to turn now to Kubla Khan real quickly. Actually, check that. Before I do that, just because I'm here and it's in the order of sequence, I want to go ahead and look real quickly at the question on A23. The question on A23, I'm helping you now to outline very quickly, all right? Just so you've got a sense of what you're doing. I will tell you in advance, this is not an easy question for you to write on. It's made easier by our observations regarding Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. Step one, you must read, step one, you must read uh, Bora's observations on Coldridge's dreamscape. So that's the first thing you've got to do, all right? You've got to read this little uh, cutting that starts on 821 to 822, all right? That's job one. Two, you need to answer the four questions at the top of 823. If you can't answer those four questions, you ain't going to be able to write this paper. Does that make sense? They're kind of setup questions. But finally, the writing prompt itself is on 823, and this is the paper you're writing for next Tuesday. How does... Bora's evaluation of the rhyme of the ancient mariner. Compare with your own view of the poem. Consider whether you agree or disagree with Bora's position. Now your thesis then will say something to the effect. The Bora position taken in dreamscape is an accurate position regarding rhyme of the ancient mariner. Or it's an inaccurate position in regards to rhyme of the ancient mariner. 
don't say I disagree or agree with Bora because the phrasing then makes you sound more like a sophomore and less like a senior. But ultimately, that's what you're doing. You're either going to agree with Bora's position on Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, or you're going to disagree. Now, hello, you can't write this paper if you don't understand what Bora is saying about Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. So you've got to read the passage, a literary analysis first. Once you feel comfortable with what it is Bora is saying about Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, you are then ready to write the paper, agreeing or disagreeing. Obviously, you've got to take a position on this poem as well whether you agree or disagree with Bora's position. And then you're going to, this is important, you're going to come up with three reasons why, I'd write this down, three reasons why you agree or disagree with Bora's position. Come up with three reasons why. Now what then is listed as one through four at the bottom of 823 is an attempt to try and help as much as possible to help you uh, uh, with that, you know, with the framing, the outlining of that, of that question. All right? Finally, now I'm ready to go to Kublai Khan in the <coughs> final minutes. There are two kinds of poems. Are you ready to go on? Here, I'm, I'm helping you get ready for the exam, obviously. There are two kinds of poems that we study. One kind of poem <coughs> is a poem that is intentionally didactic, instructional. It's a <coughs> propedeutic is the word. It tells us something we're supposed to learn or know, right? When you finish it, you're supposed to go, I understand something. Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, classic example. Ten Turn Abbey, classic example. My heart leaps up when I behold a rainbow in the sky, classic example. When you finish reading the poem, you're supposed to say, I now understand something I didn't understand before, or I'm reminded of something I had forgotten that I understood before. That's the first kind of poem. It is didactic, it's instructional. Maybe we could say it that way, it teaches a lesson. The second kind of poem is a different kind of poem. Hello? If you don't understand what I'm saying, this poem is not going to make any sense to you. If you go to Kubla Khan and you try and work at 2A to find themes or messages, you ain't going to find any. This is the second kind of poem. It's a poem that is to be experienced, not understood. To be experienced. It is a poem that is written for no reason other than the experience of the language itself or the picture that it will draw. Now I can help you. This is a very easy poem once you understand what I just said. Kubla Khan is Coldridge's poem about a famous place that he heard about called Xanadu in uh, northern China called Mongolia. It's a huge, huge castle pleasure dome that a guy made there, okay? And he describes in detail all about this kind of haunted place, this mythic place called Xanadu. Now, there are some implications, if you want, of what Coldridge, the game Coldridge is playing as he stoned writes this poem. One of those observations is that, and you may want to write this down at 2A, it's certainly a potential message theme, but I'm helping you to get there. Times are changing, and Coldridge is aware of this. Times are changing. This amazing kind of Eden-like place, at the end, at the end it's fairly clear, Kubla Khan, the leader of this place, he has a sense that something bad is coming, that you can't live in Eden forever. Sooner or later, Everything kind of changes and evolves, and that can be kind of sad. But I want to point out to you that this poem will elicit all five of the senses. So as you, as you sit down to study this poem one more time for the exam, ask yourself the simple question. From this poem, what does Coldridge want us to see, taste, touch, feel, and smell? If you can come up with those five answers, you'll see all five of the senses are related in this poem. It's almost as if Coldridge is imagining what this place Xanadu looks like and he wants you to experience it by eliciting all five of those senses. Okay, So as you go to the poem, look at that. Beyond that, you're not supposed to finish this poem and say, 
What is it that Coulter is just teaching me? No, no, no. Way wrong answer. This, this is a second kind of poem. This is, a di this is not a didactic poem. There's no instruction going on here. If you go to this poem looking at this poem the way you would look at Ten Turn Abbey or The World is Too Much With Us or Arrive at the Ancient Manor, you're going to walk away and go, this was a stupid poem. I don't understand. What's the meaning of the poem? You missed it. You missed it. This poem doesn't have a meaning. It has an experience or an invitation to an experience. And sometimes if you'll think about it, some of the music you listen to is that way. Some of the music that you listen to has some kind of meaning in the lyrics. Others of the music that you listen to, and that's the music oftentimes that has no lyrics even, it's not so much about teaching you something, and more about kind of giving you this certain kind of feeling that you're supposed to have. Got me? So as we, uh, as we finish now, that's my recommendation to you. Okay? Thank you. How much time?